All right, so what I'm going to try and focus on the next 20 minutes or so is the uh, changes that have happened uh, in the field of multiple myeloma, especially over the past decade or two. So I'll start off with, um, you know, well, these are my disclosures. And I will start off with where we were you know, a couple of decades ago. So this was actually um, a study or a study that looked at data from a lot of different clinical trials that were done prior to 2000 and looked at the median survival of patients with multiple myeloma. And at that time, it was estimated that the average or, or the what we call the median uh, survival is about two and a half years in multiple myeloma. Now let's take a look at what has changed and why it has changed and where it is going um, in, in, this, in this area. So before that, I think, you know, one of the questions um, that often comes up is whether we can cure patients with multiple myeloma. And Dr. Rajiv already alluded to this earlier on. So one way of looking at whether diseases can be cured is to see if after a defined uh, time period uh, after diagnosis, whether the patients are continuing to die because of the disease. And on the top left is what we see in Hodgkin's lymphoma you heard a little bit about in the previous talks. Um, and you look, the another one is the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And then there is follicular lymphoma, which is a different type of lymphoma, which is considered more interlinked. And you can see that if you actually survive for um, three years after your diagnosis with Hodgkin's lymphoma, the chances of you actually dying from the disease is pretty low. Almost practically, you are your risk, risk is the same as a normal uh, patient or person. So suggesting that the vast majority of the people three years from diagnosis are, um, are cured, or if they don't have evidence of disease at that point, they are unlikely to have the lymphoma come back. Unfortunately, that's not the case for multiple myeloma. Even after three years of diagnosis, even if you don't have active disease, the majority of the patients, the myeloma will continue to come back as indicated by this black line, compared to what you would have expected is the red line. Now, the question is, how can we get there? And we certainly have made a lot of progress in the past 10 to 20 years that has put us on a path to getting to a cure in this disease. Now, one of the critical things with all cancers, not just myeloma, is that if you want to cure the cancer, we need to understand what makes the cancer tick. So understanding that disease biology is very, very important. We also want to ensure that patients are treated at the right stage of the disease uh, progression. We need the right tools in order to do that, which in your case would be the medications, the transplant, and some of the new therapies um, that um, Dr. Rajiv already alluded to. Um, we need to treat them for the right duration um, in order to prevent the disease from coming back. And when the disease do come back in patients, we need to understand why that happens. And we need to do this all in the context of you know, balancing the, the efficacy of the treatment, the side effects, and the impact the treatment side effects can have on the quality of life. So let's first talk about disease biology. You know, one of the things we have really uh, come to understand over the past few years is that even though all the myeloma looks and behaves same in the clinic, they you do the same test, they all, all the cells look the same under the microscope. Uh, they all come, uh, patients all uh, present with similar uh, problems like the high calcium, the renal or the kidney problems, the bone disease, anemia, all of which Dr. Rajiv referred to before. However, once you start looking under the hood, all these different myelomas are very different. And the major difference lies in the type of genetic abnormalities that these myeloma cells or the plasma cells have and without going into details, uh, there are three or four major categories of abnormalities. One of them is duplications of chromosomes. So you can have, instead of two chromosomes of a particular type, you can have three or four at times. There are other conditions called translocations where a piece of chromosome from one chromosome goes and gets stuck to another one. Then there are what we call um, monosomies, which is loss of one of the chromosomes or you could lose a piece of a chromosome, what we call as deletions, or else you could gain a piece, which is often talk, uh, referred to as amplification. 
But in addition to these big changes in the structure of the chromosomes, there can also be small changes in the, um, in, the, in the genes themselves. And we are starting to learn more and more about those. Some of these changes are present at the time of diagnosis and others appear as the patients go through different treatments. And what, do, what does that mean for the patients uh, in terms of their uh, long-term outlook? And this is a um, simple system that we created and very similar to others out there where we can look at the number of what we call high-risk features. In this case, you have the different genetic abnormalities. We also have some blood markers like LDH um, and also um, other staging systems like the ISS that is also based on blood markers like protein, albumin, and uh, uh, beta-2 microglobulin. The bottom line is by using all these different characteristics, we can group patients into three, four, or five groups all with very different survival from the time of diagnosis. So obviously, not only do we need to get all these lines move up with our treatment so that everybody has benefit, but our job is even more tougher for those patients within the blue line, which are those patients with multiple high-risk abnormalities, because it's going to take us more than uh, just a one-size-fits-all approach in order to improve their outcomes. Now, the reason myeloma is such a tough disease sometimes to treat uh, is because it continuously uh, changes its uh, genetic makeup or characteristics. And some of it is because there are changes that happen within a, each cell in a serial fashion. But another important concept is that even at the time of diagnosis, you have a, a varied group of myeloma cells present and they kind of go up and down depending upon whether the treatment um, being administered is effective against one or more of those. This is a great example of a patient where a diagnosis, you can, you know, these different colors represent different clones or different subgroups of myeloma cells. And there is a sliver of blue here, which you can barely appreciate. But as the patient goes through different treatments over time, that blue sliver increases in size, increases in size. And finally, the, all the myeloma cells pretty much uh, comes from that particular uh, clone or group of cells, which eventually leads to this patient's demand.